And somehow um, we've gotten the idea around here that old is not necessarily good or even functional. Um, when it comes to furnaces, perhaps that might be true, or other appliances and so on, but when it comes to steam heat, um, the building's what, 87 years old, 85 years old? That's like a spring chicken. The boiler itself, they go, they go you know, 15, 20 years. So that's been replaced, I'm sure, a number of times, and, and it was originally coal. because you can see the coal shoots and ash shoots and so on. But the piping and the radiators, as long as they're kept clean and you maintain them, they're going to be good for a couple of hundred. Reminds me of the, the tile roofing that's up on the main sanctuary hip roof. Um, that tile is typically salvaged from buildings when it's torn down after 100 or 150 years and used on another building for another century. And that's how long some of this stuff can last. Uh, one of the books that I learned about steam heating from, um, this person went out and interviewed various um, you know, people to see how their system worked and what they knew about it um, from 50, 60, 70 years ago. And they have pictures of radiators that were around when Ben Franklin was in, this, in the room, and they're still operating as it was then. They haven't painted them. They haven't done anything. They look the same. They're operating just fine. It's all about keeping them clean and keeping them maintained. It's telling us. So I don't buy the whole thing about it's, it's um, you know, old and therefore obsolete and need to be replaced and all that type of thing. Um, it just needs to be properly cared for. So I kind of developed a strategy of, of how to maintain this, and I came about it from a couple of different perspectives. Um, one was to realize that there aren't any absolutes in terms of maintenance, like that low water cutoff valve. Really, from the day you put it in, it starts deteriorating. You're dealing with steam. You're dealing with high, pr you know, not high pressure, but uh, high temperatures, and it's just a cranky system. So it's a matter of, well, does it last a year? five years, ten years, we don't know. I mean, ten years, it's probably going to be really um, way beyond um, wanting to replace it, but you don't need to replace it every year or two either. So somewhere in between is reasonable. So I think it's a matter of balancing. This is a, a great opportunity to balance cost with risk or reward and to really put that in perspective of, of how we would, as a systems person, put that in perspective of the organization's goals. You know, our goal, I don't think, is to be an NSP or something and have 100% you know, reliable uh, everything. We certainly want to have reliable systems, but everything comes with a cost and there is no such thing as 100% reliability, so it's a matter of balancing that, and that's kind of the approach I took on a lot of the, the controls. And then the other dimension to that is the labor factor, because the parts are expensive no matter what. But we can refurbish them, and we can um, use volunteer labor, but that also comes and goes. So it's a matter of do we have to use um, you know, a contractor, or can we use volunteer, and what's reasonable to expect now and in the future. And I think that that changes over time. You know? It may be perfectly reasonable to use a volunteer today, but it won't be six months from now. Um, and for some applications, it may not be um, you know, applicable ever. So those are the kind of things that we have to balance. And I think we can move along these continuums in an intelligent way by looking at all of the factors that are going into having a reliable system and then balancing each one of those in concert. And that's really what um, being a systems person is all about, and be able to come back with recommendations um, that make sense in terms of the organization's goals, and then measure those to see how we did, and not so much to blame or to uh, praise, but to improve. So we see how we did, and then we can follow it with um, you know, an improvement to that. If we um, spend $10,000 or something, that we didn't have to, then I would certainly hope that we wouldn't do that again. Um, but it might be just the opposite, where we have something cobbled together or, uh, you know, by a volunteer, and we really should have spent the money. But um, my whole goal here was to quantify that and not just uh, be based on fear or based on um, you know, uh, status quo or what have you. So you're going to see a lot of that balancing, and that's something that doesn't really need to, to get into 
decision maker's hands because it's um, it's something that could be recommended, but it has to be recommended as a package deal, and it can't be you know picking. You can't say, "Oh, I want to have this and I want to have that," uh, without getting into the minutia of the details. So um, it's really kind of an all or nothing in terms of the analysis itself. Uh, and and a lot of this, the other you know, a dimension here is really how much time are we willing to put into keeping things clean and maintained. Um, if we have to pay somebody, and, and steam fitters and boiler people are expensive. We're talking two to three hundred dollars an hour for some of these people. So if you want somebody to come in and clean that 150 float valve once a week, um, it's not going to take too many cleanings to justify replacing it. But if you have a volunteer who's willing to come in and do it once a week, um, and it takes maybe a minute, a minute and a half if you're really slow, um, and you just pull the belt, you know, it's not a lot of work, but it needs to be done if you're already here, I would say that that's a pretty good trade-off. But if that person's not around, then we may have to rebalance things again. Um, but it's really all about the, the maintenance and the cleanliness of the system and the consistency of that maintenance. And by maintenance, I don't mean necessarily replacing parts or repairing something. It's more about doing the blowdowns, um, just keeping an eye on things, measuring water, keeping the chemistry correct, things of that nature. Or your operating maintenance is very, very important with a steam system. They don't just run on their own, but they can be incredibly reliable and last for literally centuries if you have a good systematic process in place. And that's why the logging is so important and the uh, measuring of results is important and so forth. Okay, so an example would be, of how I balance this, would be that 150 float valve. When I inherited the system from Phil, um, he said that was um, a little cantankerous back then, and that was a number of years ago where it, the, the float, you know, remember there's a, there's a ball here that floats in water with this lever coming off of it, and there's the water, and it's in this outer shell, and occasionally it gets gummed up in there, this little lever gets gummed up and um, either sticks for a little bit or it just gets off by a little bit. So the boiler might flood a little bit where it gets too high of water, which causes carryover and it tends to cause water hammer, or it might drop a little bit and actually hit the low water cutoff and shut off until the pump makes up and then it kicks in again. So it's, it probably doesn't affect the heat, but it's not the best thing where the, the thing gets shut off. Uh, prematurely. Um, and that's prevented by doing the blowdowns regularly and then you can actually take those eight bolts out and just clean the darn thing and it works as well. But at some point of course it just gets all rusty and gooky and has to be replaced. So that's the one that I was looking at and I knew that it was already a problem and it had a secondary issue with it and that is the switches in there were mercury and you can't buy mercury switches anymore, so therefore the replacement valve that's going to go in here is going to have these little tiny uh, reed switches, just little th uh, pieces of um, real thin metal that replace the mercury. Well, mercury can switch big motor currents. These little reed switches cannot. So the, f the, the first switch in here is the one that controls that feed water pump, and that works great with the mercury switches, but with the reed switches, it's going to burn them right up. So we have to do some wiring, basically, and put a relay in here. It's no big deal, but it adds more cost. And if we're going to contract it, and you got to bring an electrician in, in addition to the boiler guy, and, and so on and so forth. So it's just another, another headache. Um, so that was the other factor I was trying to weigh in there. And um, we had an, a second 150 valve with mercury um, switches in it as a backup. Um, it was also on here at one point, so it's not brand new, but it allows us to have two sets of parts to, to swap things back and forth, so that gave me some flexibility. So I thought this is a great opportunity to really see you know, where the, the logical point is to cause the replacement to happen and to, to measure that. To me, the, the cost is going to be about $2,100 to have someone come in and do it. That's what I estimated that at. If 
we do it myself, it was going to be about 800. So that would be kind of, I guess the volunteer should be over there, but that would be um, that option. So I was really looking at the 800. And the other option I had is somewhere in between here where I could rebuild it. And that would be about 25 to $50. And that's actually what I ended up doing, because all I needed is a new gasket and some new fittings. And you can actually buy parts for this, so we put about $50 into it. And then on the other side over here is, you know, what's the downfall? Um, is it going to cause catastrophic failure? No, I mean, you can get a new one put in in a day. Um, and even if you couldn't or didn't want to, it's not going to completely fail overnight. It's a toilet float valve. It's going to fail eventually, yes, but it's not going to just go from sort of operating to completely dead in one day. It's going to just get more grouchy. So it's kind of like jiggling the toilet. You have to kind of say, well, how much am I going to jiggle the toilet before I'm going to call the plumber? That's really what this one comes down to. And in this case, you have to do the blowdowns no matter what. And if the water chemistry is clean, I found out that it really isn't that grouchy at all. It's only grouchy when it gets gummed up because we haven't done the blowdowns and the water chemistry is messed up so it's carrying sludge in from the pipes and it gets all uh, full of that crud in there. Then you've got to take it apart and flush it out and um, you know that would be the equivalent of jiggling the toilet thing because it's not going to work. It's going to stick and we're going to have a heat out. Someone's going to have to go down there and jiggle it basically. So I figured, and I, I, uh, I talked to the internal customer, in this case, uh, capacitors, and said, what would be a reasonable trade-off for $800 to $2,100 of expense over the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months? How many times would it be worth going down and jiggling the valve if you had a heat out? That would be one condition, would be a inconvenience and you know, you would have a heat out. So um, you'd probably go a couple hours before you even notice that you had a heat out. So it would be cold. You'd have to go down, take two or three minutes to do this. Um, how many times, if any, would you be willing to put up with that for this trade-off? And then number two was, for me, you know, I needed to come in here daily and flush this out, which is really more often than it would normally do. We'd do it about once a week or twice a week. And... Um, take it apart probably about twice a year and just thoroughly clean it out. So that was kind of my trade-off. You know, how many times was I willing to do that? And I think we came up with two to three times for the pastors and two to three times of the clean-out uh, for me. And so that's how far I thought we'd let it run. So instead of saying we're going to replace it now or we're going to replace it a year from now, I thought we would actually wait until we have two to three um, opportunities for them to come down and, and jiggle it and two to three opportunities for me to clean it out. Let's see how much time elapses. And we were at, I think, two and a half years and counting and uh, we were still going. And interestingly enough, the, the beginning of that is when the boiler hadn't been refurbished and the water chemistry wasn't quite right and so on. So there were, um, I believe, one or two incidents in there that we could probably legitimately count, but ever since we got this program put in place where we were keeping things clean and so on, and we had those indicator lights to tell them which one to uh, reset if they needed to, there weren't any of these conditions, and I didn't have to clean it out. Well, I guess I did once because I was asked to, but I really didn't need to. So at two and a half years, we were going strong, probably on borrowed time. So. I think the recommendation I made at that point, and I know this is long-winded, but I think this is really the crux of a lot of decisions in terms of mechanical systems. So it wasn't so much this dimension that was of concern to me as it was this one. So as long as we had a volunteer who was willing to do this and we had pastors that understood the situation, then we should let this play out maybe for another year. So we shouldn't let it go much longer than that. Um, if not, then we should just go ahead and replace it because it's been two and a half years, it's original equipment, so we're talking 12 years on that valve and it's way, way past, you know, it should be replaced. And so as soon as the volunteer goes away or, like I say, they don't want to have to deal with that potentiality of going down and resetting it or having to go without heat for a couple of hours, then let's just go ahead and replace it and we should expect the $2,100.
that's the way I look at things, of how to balance it. If the volunteer stays here and they're still okay with it, would have gone probably between one and two years, and this can be budgeted then, it's negotiable because there's nothing magic about one year, six months, or two years, it just needs to be replaced somewhere in that reasonable range as long as this doesn't start getting to be more frequent. Um, and then we'd be looking at the $800 though. So we could say we have a two year horizon to spend $800. And I think that that's a pretty reasonable thing to budget for and plan for and is directly correlated to the reliability of the system. So um, the, the risk financially would be that we just have to replace it right away. And I think that that's a contingent that you can put in there and on all these parts, when we go through part by part by part, you could say either the $800 or the $2,100, you could just put them all in there and then you know, factor in that um, for Murphy's Law or whatever, uh, you know, there's a 10% chance that um, the whole thing's just not going to work as planned and we're going to have to replace something. Um, certainly we'd want to do that, but again, measure that because um, that's a very different scenario than what I've portrayed here, and we certainly want to know um, about an emergency like that because um, it really shouldn't be the case. Um, these things are, are pretty predictable. Okay, another strategy I had is to make this somewhat friendly for lay people and staff, even though they are not legally um, able to operate the system, but as a practical matter, if there's no heat, they're going to do something about it. They're either going to call uh, me or a, a tech or someone and ask for advice and then they can certainly do it um, based on that as long as uh, the person signs off on it and logs it. The problem is, is that if you don't know uh, what's going on, then you're ending up having to um, have them go down and get all dirty and grimy because these valves are really nasty and, and you know, try different uh, blow downs and try this and try that and it's not um, something that's really fun to do with someone on the phone, which um, I found on several occasions. So I took two approaches to that. One is the prolifics thermostat the Prolifix T-STAT, which controls this for a nice box. And if you recall in the previous videos, it um, just has the heat one line coming out and that's all for the boiler, but it has the alarms. So if the power comes from the boiler, so if the power goes out um, and it misses its calling home to the mothership every hour on the hour, it's going to alert you saying that, hey, there's no power to the boiler. Or if one of these low water cutoffs trip, and that second one would, which locks it out so the system can't refire when there's a call for heat, obviously the temperature in the building is going to fall. So I can set a low temperature um, alarm, and we may want to set that fairly high to like you know, 60 or something. So if it falls to 60 degrees, it's going to beat me on my cell phone, so I know that something's up. I can then connect in through the remote access to look at the thermostat and see if it's actually trying to fire or what is going on. I could actually reset it so that that low water reset um, resets itself. Um, and we can also do a high, although the high temperature typically isn't a problem. We could say 75 or 80 degrees that you know, something's wrong, It's uh, but that would be most likely someone to set the thermostat too high. So this gives us a, a proactive approach to say there's a heat out, we don't have to wait for someone to call, track me down, you know, kill a half to three quarters of a day just on that before we even start troubleshooting. This will let me know probably before anybody in the office even notices, particularly if there's a power problem where it can't fire because it will it'll beat me right away. And then with the remote access I can do the troubleshooting. The only thing we can't do is deal with the valve. So if we have to do a blowdown or something like that uh, 150 valve got gummed up and stuck or something, we do have to have help with that. So that's why Develop that little box, and it's got six lights on it. It's just very simple. And each light turns on progressively as the system starts up. So when there's a call for heat from the thermostat, this line from the thermostat comes over and says we need to have heat. First thing it does is it sends a signal over to the 150 low water cutoff and makes sure that it is closed so that the adequate water. And if that's the case, then this is the 150, this light turns on. Then it goes over to the 167, or the, I'm just the 67, the other low water cutoff, if that one's closed, this light turns on. Then it goes to the high pressure cutoff. 
if that one's okay that light turns on then it goes over to the um, the gas if the gas is okay then this light turns on then it goes to the operating pressure troll and if it's okay that light turns on and it does the pilot so I should have maybe had another light there if that one's okay and the pilot proves out that it's actually there then the um, last one comes on which is the actual flame which means it's firing and that light comes on there are different colored lights so it goes ding 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 and then it's up and going if it doesn't go all the way through all six it's not going to go so wherever it stops is where the problem is so if they go downstairs there's no heat i call and say that i got a beep from the thing um, i can't reset it can you go see what's going on and they can say the first three are lit but th this one's not i know i have a gas problem if the uh, 67 is not lit all they have to do is is crank down the lever for about two or three seconds blow down some water shut it and 99.9% .9 of the time that's going to clear it and that light will instantly come on and then that will come on that will come on that will come on and then it will fire so it's just that simple whereas in the old days we had to kind of go in there and bang around with pipes and and try different valves and experiment and so on um, pretty simple thing but each one of these lights tells you um, the progression of the safety systems and then of course the alarm on the side if that goes off um, you should just flee the neighborhood in the county because it's not a good sign. Um, now just as a, as a point as the thing operates it's going to hit a certain pressure like the one and a half pounds where the pressure control operating control turns it off so the flame's going to go off the pilot and the operating is going to go off these four will stay on saying there's still a call for heat but we're stopping at the operating control until it drops down to a half a pound and then ding that'll turn on the pilot comes on and then the main flame comes on uh, when the call for heat has been satisfied then you'll see them go all the way back to being completely off so this is certainly a tool for um, the boiler operating and for me and for um, you know diagnosing the system but mostly it's for the people around the office so that they can quickly um, figure out what's going on okay another strategy I came up with is a low impact way of dealing with steam traps steam traps are, are uh, everything they account for enormous amounts of energy being wasted if the steam makes a round trip and they only last a couple of years because that little um, disc in there that little thermostatic disc just takes a beating tens of thousands of times vibrating back and forth so they need to be replaced the problem is if you remember what they look like um, you know, there's some big old fittings on there and if you're talking a new building I suppose it's not a, a real big deal as long as you get the same trap and the same dimensions and everything it'll just bolt right on and away you go um, it's not exactly rocket science it just this has a, a female threading on it and and this just bolts right up um, the, the cap actually unscrews so you can get inside there um, and you can replace them that way the problem is the radiator traps are pretty old and they still make believe it or not replacements for them but they're typically smaller and a little different shape um, you know it only has to be off by an eighth of an inch in one dimension and it's not going to fit so this stuff is very precise and then you have to start jockeying stuff around and even worse is that these fittings um, are steam so they're going to be grouched to begin with but they're also 85 years old and you start torquing on them next thing you know you've broken um, you know a cast iron radiator because if you look at the radiator here they're cast iron fittings and you, you crack that you whap it one at the wrench and it cracks it right off you're going to have to then tap a new hole or you break the pipe that goes down in the boiler room you're talking literally thousands of dollars on some of this stuff uh, we had a, a a little tiny pinhole in one of the condensate return pipes during the furnace construction year and they were quoting like seven to ten thousand dollars to replace that section of pipe that was only uh, a three-quarter inch pipe by about 15 feet long but it was also right in the proximity of a whole ton of um, asbestos and they were afraid that if 
they were to take that one section out, then the elbows would break, and if the elbows break, the next section would break, and the next. So um, that's what you want to avoid. Um, and I came up with a, a strategy for that as well. We'll, we'll go over here. Um, but the radiator strategy was to be low impact and to be kind and gentle and to keep things in the original condition and to not replace the steam traps. The way you do that is they make steam trap kits now and you convert the steam traps. So ours kind of look like this. They're big old honkers and the lid screws off and it's got a, uh, like a spring and a thermostatic device and then another spring that kind of seats down in here. And you buy these conversion kits for about $40 a piece and you pull the guts out and throw those away. So you just have this housing. But the housing, remember, is fastened to the radiator and to the condensate return pipe. So that's part of the building. This just screws off. Those are a little bit hard to get off, but you um, use some solvents and some very gentle uh, torquing with a large wrench and you can get those to come off. Clean these all up inside. This just becomes now a housing. And you buy a, um, a module, which is like a mini steam trap inside of a steam trap. And the module just slides in here and then they give you a new cap that's a little bit bigger that goes up and goes over. So this just becomes a housing. But because you don't have to deal with these pipes, there's virtually no impact. You just have to take that top off one time and then put their top on with a nice um, gasket and some um, silicon. So they come off fairly easy in the future. And then you just unscrew the top and you pop out these modules, which are about $35 a piece. You can take them downstairs. We make a little test fixture where you can see if they're working or not. If they're working, put them back in. If not, throw them out, replace them. We could buy a small inventory of those and away you go. With a piped-in radiator trap, you really don't know if it's failing or not. Unless you have a way of looking at what's coming out of this bottom pipe by putting in some type of T arrangement and having the pipe open to see if there's steam coming out of it, you really don't know because it just goes downstream with all the other radiators. And if there's steam coming out, you really don't know which one it is. You can use like a, a stethoscope. I tried that. And you can put like temperature probes here and here to see if the temperature differential to see if it really is, um, you know, lower than the pressure, the, the temperature of steam converting to condensate. And then most likely that one is failing. Um, but then you got to like unbolt the thing and bolt a new one in. And then if you go to test it, you know, at that point, no one's going to put it back in again after that much labor because you're talking uh, a fair amount of work. And like on these MEPCOs here, you know, these will replace what we have, but they're of a different shape. You know, ours are more like this. And you're going to have to come up with little elbows and, and just little tiny corrections, which just are a real pain. Uh, it wouldn't be so bad if it was off by a lot, but it's just off by a tiny little amount. And it doesn't take much, like I said before, to crack a radiator or to crack a pipe. Um, and it, it's just really unnecessary because of this um, steam trap modular approach. And um, they make conversion kits for virtually every steam trap made. We have about eight different models, believe it or not, and, and brands throughout the building. And rather than trying to standardize them, since they're just going to be a container, we went ahead and found um, the conversion kits for every one of them. And uh, the plan was to replace them uh, a third, third, and third. Uh, each year because um, we want to spend about 700 to 800 dollars each year on the conversions. So um, that was a good program, but it, um, right now um, we're not doing that. So the book really talked about two different approaches to dealing with these old systems. One is the, I think it's called the Macho Man, which means we're just going to um, arm wrestle this thing to, into submission. We're going to, if the pipes aren't cooperative, then we're going to saw them off and we're going to get out the, the blowtorch and we're going to retap holes. And uh, if you know, those aren't cooperative, we'll just keep in, you know, an invasive approach until we get the system to, to go into submission. So it's really the piping, um, kind of manhandling the piping and, and redoing it, taking you know the sections out, uh, changing angles or whatever it is, uh, changing out radiators, 
traps, um, changing some of the angles so that the new style will fit, um, maybe even changing radiators and removing radiators, that type of thing. And then, um, so that, like the, the, the piping being wrestled around, but it's also being changed in terms of the number of angles or, or the way that the steam is being routed uh, is another area of, the, of kind of this macho man approach. And then the other big one is the pressure where, like some of the, the newer systems where more is better, it's assumed that higher pressure is desirable. And when the system starts complaining because it's of the higher pressure, then it's a matter of going back up to here again and wrestling with the piping and so on until you get it to cooperate. So that's what they describe as kind of the macho man approach. And naturally, I didn't know anything about that since this is not my background. But interestingly enough, um, this seems to be dominant. Wherever I've seen anybody work on a system in the last few years that I've been paying attention, this is what happens. And you start with a, you know, a little bit of money, and then you start going to a lot of money, and then a lot, 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 and it just seems to just keep going until the system is beat into submission. And according to this book, it doesn't really ever happen. It just is a continuous process because it's just a path that doesn't make sense. So they suggest, instead of this macho man approach, they suggest the learning how the system was originally designed and restoring it back to its original intent because everything had a purpose. Unfortunately, everybody's dead and they didn't really leave much documentation behind because it was something that was taught um, you know, verbally from generation to generation. So they call it the Dead Man's Club or Society instead of the Macho Man Club or Society. And this entire book goes through and looks at the history and tries to reverse engineer and really understand these systems. And naturally not every system is as great as others, but we have every reason to believe that we have the cream of the crop. Everything about this building in terms of materials and the way the original furnace was designed, the uh, uh, construction technique, uh, everything has really um, been pointed out to us through the appraisal that it's been top notch, the best you could get. And Everything that I can see, and people have told me about the piping and the radiating, radiating systems and so on, uh, was indeed top notch. So it seems logical that we would follow this dead man's approach and get the thing back to the way it was. And the book, um, Dan Holloman, Holleran, who is by far the world's authority on steam heating, says that one, if you get all the piping back the way it was, all the angles, the dimensions of the, of the pipe, the traps, everything back the way it was originally intended. And you get the pressure way, way down to where it is going to operate less than a pound and a half at all times. If you do these two things, Virtually every problem will just vaporize on its own. And the problems go away. And your energy is going to go way down because of this. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what that actually means and the details of that. Uh, and that's the part I really found fascinating because to understand this means you need to really understand what was going on at the time in history and see how these brilliant people were able to get very well balanced, energy efficient systems at a time there was no electricity and no computers and anything of that nature. Um, and we've done everything in our power over the years to fight against that, to go with this approach. So um, it made perfect sense to me that we do this non-invasive, re replace the traps with these cages, um, get rid of this macho approach, go back to this, and restore things to its original state, crank the pressure down, and then deal with the risk reward of the ongoing component replacement um, in terms of the organization's overall goals, in terms of so, you know, what's important and what's not. Certainly having heat for, for uh, the sanctuary is, but I don't know that having a one hour, two hour heat out in the office, um, a couple temperature degree, couple degree temperature 
once or twice a year um, would be a reasonable trade-off for maybe a couple of thousand dollars worth of savings if both sides can be quantified. And I think that's important to do. So those are the, the three central tenets to the strategy that I have.